My own background is university researcher for 10 years on a wide variety of things, a whole sequence of startups in California, a lot of open source. I've been involved now in open source for four decades. And currently, I'm the VP of Incubator at Apache. My particular claim to fame is that I bought the beer at the first Hadoop users group. Now, let's go informal here. No need for the branding right here. This is going to be a little bit of an odd talk. It's kind of a keynote. But when you see glitzy, fancy slides, keep in mind that the very next thing you're going to see is the tech underneath. So this is going to be a talk that opens the curtain and shows where the business impacts tie in to the technical aspects. So just a note for the wise there. So if we look at the overall IT spend in the world, what we see is that budgets are relatively constant, growing very slowly. The requirements are growing extremely fast, however, much faster than any budget growth at any large organization that I know of. And that means that the displacement of funding toward new technologies that can achieve these goals at cost-effective rates is becoming very dramatic. It's just a squeeze play. And without getting the 20 to 50x cost advantage in terms of the cost to store and to process data, these IT organizations will be completely unable to function. And so that next-gen growth, which is the blue bar there, versus the legacy market growth, is becoming dramatic. And if you just draw that line out, and if you compound it, it's easy to come up with a figure that over the next four to five years, 90% of new data, and very, very soon, 90% of all data, because legacy data will be a very small fraction, will be on these new technologies. That means that 90% of the overall curatorial mission of an IT organization is going to be, have to be devoted to this. And that means that everybody has to understand how these systems work and how to make them do what you need to do. And there are some very big differences. Uh, now, our own particular view of this, and I'm going to give you a, an opinionated view here, is that there's multiple forms of persistence and multiple forms of processing that one key to the big data revolution is dissociating, not necessarily dislocating, but, but separating the computational function from the persistence function, making them independent. That lets us cycle on the processing side very quickly. The mass in the persistence is going to be difficult to, to, to cycle, and so that's where we've put our efforts very substantially. And we see that there are multiple forms of persistence that are required. And from our history, you can see that we started with improved Hadoop. We added NoSQL in the same platform. We've added interactive, uh, interactive SQL onto non-traditional data sources and global event streaming with more to come. The goal here is, now this is a glitzy slide, keep in mind, good stuff coming. The goal here partly is to reduce costs. That's the first half of that story, but also to enable innovation. So let's talk a little bit about what it takes to reduce the cost. A little bit of real slides here. Here we go. So our, our history, our vision over this time is that over the past half century, there has been enormous progress made in building systems that are highly interoperable, highly compatible, and very functional. 40 years ago, if you wanted a file in an enterprise application, you had to have a committee meeting. The committee meeting would start off with, did you have hardware budget? Did you have floor space allocated? Do you have an after hours call person? Do you have a contingency plan for your file? Today, that would be considered insane. And the progress from that committee meeting to now, where a developer would never ask permission just to have a file, is the progress that the communities, especially the Unix community and now the Linux community, have made over those years. 
Sadly, in order to get scale, and there was an exigent need for scale roughly 10 years ago, the Hadoop community emulated parts of what Google had done, and we gave up, I was a part of that game, uh, we gave up a lot of that compatibility in order to get scale. And the vision that we have at MapR is that we need to restore that functionality and go beyond that. So that's what we've done is we've built systems and technology to try to restore those APIs, restore that compatibility and functionality, and then with the current red branding, go further and produce more, adding tables, streaming, global replication to the base file system. So that's the basic technical vision that underlies that slide. We talk about convergence. We talk about having all of these multiple forms of persistence in the same platform, in the same system. The same code does this. The same data structures implement these multiple kinds of persistence. Tables everybody knows. And the, the difference between these, the bytes are no different. The difference is how you add things, how you access things, and how things disappear. Files we understand, they have a beginning, they go forward to some unspecified maximum size. They have a current maximum, but their ultimate maximum is notionally unbounded. You can delete an entire file at a time. Tables are different in that insertions in the middle and deletions in the middle are easy. So they have a different pattern there. That added complexity of the life cycle of tables means that they're not usually as performant for file-like operations like scanning. And lately, we have streams. Now, this is different than the old message streams that people have seen before, but the basic idea is that you add data to the end, like a file, and you delete it from the beginning, like neither of the other two. So it has the simplicity and performance of files, but it has various other aspects as well. And we'll talk about how that plays in. So let's go back to Glitz. This is one of our customers, IRI. What they do is they take retail consumption point of sale data and they see which products were purchased, which products were purchased together, and they collate that and pass that data back to the manufacturers of those products so that people can see where the things they're building are sold, especially in a consumer setting. Now, the way they used to do that was with a the mainframe. They had mainframe, and they didn't even use SQL databases. They had their own technology for delivering this data at very high speed, but some of their problems had to do with multiple system maintenance and things like that, and delivering this. The key figure of merit in their delivery was that they had to be able to deliver millions of rows of results per second. Not queries per second, but each query would return something like 10 million rows, so they had to deliver those rows quickly. And the way we did that is to largely focus on the left-hand side, files and tables. And this is a very rough outline of their processing without talking about some of their secret sauce about their late binding and magic uh, program generation. But the core problems really were, as much as anything, uh, administrative and, and just coordination sort of issues. Data actually comes in via FTP. It still does, it still will. That's not something that's easily changed because they have hundreds of thousands of retailers out there. But the nice thing is that with a first class file system that restores POSIX semantics, that can land directly in the cluster. All of the query pre-processing is large, but the second order processing for delivery is quite small. So it's very nice to be able to have big data tools and small traditional data tools interoperate cleanly. And then for delivering, what they do is they, they slice all of the possible results of their questions, basically cubing the data, but they put them into millions of files. And then they have a clever web application that just says which files have to be concatenated to get the query results for any given query that a, a customer can have. So really what they want is to route web access directly on the cluster. They don't want to be administering separate clusters for that. And the convergence that I was talking about plays both at the beginning, middle, and end. 
It's a great example of how tables, files, old tools, new tools work together. Moving along a little bit quicker, grace note. Everybody here is probably unknowingly a grace note user. Uh, if you've used iTunes, if you've used the Android equivalent, if you've stuck a CD into a player and had it recognize the CD, if you've used Netflix, if you've used uh, most televisions that have any sort of media attachment to them, you've used GraceNote. GraceNote builds a database and has for the last 20 years of all the music in the world and builds recognition software. And again, very similar to IRI, but in the, the new world, they produce aggregate information about who's playing which media files. And not who necessarily, but just in this city, this is popular. In that city, something different is popular. In this city, people play music in the morning. In that city, they play it in the evening, and that sort of thing. So they have gazillions of consumer electronics out there bringing in log files. They do pre-aggregation. They put these into columnar data stores and drive those out to ad hoc query. Their previous data cycle with conventional data warehouse tools was almost 24 hours, which, of course, was their SLA. First, they were unhappy with that such a long SLA. And secondly, they saw that impinging. By using modern tools, notably uh, Apache Drill and Parquet, they were able to drop that daily processing down to two minutes. And again, the import of data, the convergence between old and new tools, and the delivery of things to uh, dashboarding systems that they already had, all of those help with convergence. Experian is one of the three major credit union, or not credit union, credit reporting bureaus in the US. And they have a system which is difficult to draw a picture of, so I'm not going to show the behind the scenes slide for that. But they basically replaced most of their traditional storage and data warehousing systems, there's vats of them, with these new technologies in order to do that. Now we also have seen Customers change the game in their industries. Another credit bureau, TransUnion, has built what's called a data hoteling service. They sell data. They sell aggregate data. They sell economic performance data. They sell market data. They sell credit data to large-scale customers who need to make sense of their world. Unfortunately, the data is large. And moving that data efficiently and correctly is difficult. They saw one of their primary problems is, if I'm delivering data to you, your processing of that, your placing of that, your prepositioning of that so that you can use it is error prone. And I can't fix any problems that you have. And so if I have tens of thousands of customers, many of them are going to screw it up. So what they did, what TransUnion did, is turn the story around back to front so that people bring their programs to TransUnion rather than TransUnion bringing the data to the programs. They built a system which is essentially like a cloud sort of system where people can come and run analytics programs, but the data is pre-provisioned. This has a couple of advantages. The biggest one, as they said, was that the error rate of delivering this data was dramatically less because there were far fewer steps, far fewer independent sources of error. And so bringing the data sets in, doing the processing, delivering it in multiple data forms, not just columnar tables or columnar files, but also in legacy data form, being able to host those directly on the same cluster is a big advantage because then when the tenants come in and need access to different data sets, they can have it in any form that they like. And furthermore, they can access exactly the same copy with an obvious benefit. The, the, the key technology here is not just the convergence, but the ability to have multi-tenants within a same cluster without them knowing that the others are there. The convergence story then plays again in all of these steps. Most notably is the new part here is that legacy databases, SAP HANA, MySQL, 
many others, Sybase IQ, Vertica, can all run directly on this cluster. United Healthcare is the largest uh, health insurer in the US, and they've built a system very similar to others, but they've started incorporating streaming so that they can get data into the system very quickly. They have very, very large queries, and what they want to do as the first new value proposition that they have is to build fraud detection models. Anytime you have lots of money moving, and healthcare definitely has that, you have opportunities to fraud, and therefore you have fraudsters coming in and doing that. They have fraud both at the provider level and at the consumer level, and they need to find those cases and deal with them quickly. By having all of these data sets together, by having legacy data tools like SAS running directly on the cluster, along with big data tools like Spark and Flink and others, they're able to get these benefits of convergence. They've generated, according to their numbers, uh, uh, over a 2,000% return on investment. Liaison is another healthcare provider. They do electronic medical records, and they have a very strong business need for short time from data ingest to data visibility. If you have an x-ray and you move over to see the physician afterwards, that x-ray results should have already been processed, should have already been evaluated by radiologists by the time you talk to the primary care physician who's gonna be talking to you about that. And the key there is streaming. You've got lab results coming in. This is a notional diagram, but the key thing here is that you need to have isolation between these different components. And you need to have isolation such that we can be building out parts of the system even before we finish the earlier, or even, we need to be building out new parts of the system even while we've already put the previous parts into service. So if we're gonna do another version of the anomaly detection upstairs there, the incoming lab results, the order reconciliation should be completely unaffected by that. We need to be able to build a new system up there, deploy it without either the, the upstream or the downstream being affected. And if I wanna move from this into just a little bit of future tense, up to now what I've been describing is what people that I know are actually doing. But here's a little bit more of what people are beginning to do. And the idea in a lot of these things is that people are moving to what's called a stream-first architecture. The idea with stream-first architectures is that streaming data is the key connective tissue between large-scale subsystems, large or small. But that is the key shared element, whereas in older systems, the key shared element was typically either files or databases. This is a big change. But the, here's an example of where those benefits come in. The idea here is that we have a financial services use case. People are talking about dark pool trading where they may be trading between themselves in a bank or they may be trading with trusted partners that are off the exchange. These are private systems that are going without the cost of exchange trading. Each bid or offer comes in with 10 to 100 recipients of the bid or offer, and there's total universe of around 10,000 of those. Now, the, the messages come in very fast, and they have to be accessed in very, very strictly controlled ways, but also at very high speed. Normally, the response people would have is to implement this using some sort of database. It makes sense that we've got insertions happening, we've got queries happening. But what happens along the way is that when I insert the data, it comes in with one kind of locality. But when I query it, it has a very different kind of locality. The data that is near when it's inserted is very different from the data as I want to retrieve it. It comes in arranged by sender, by stock symbol, and it goes out arranged by recipient. And that causes enormous problems with performance in traditional databases. 
the solution in New York about the, the people don't normally do this with is they use a very expensive in-memory database and they wind up with an instance of that database often per stock symbol. And so we're talking about 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth dollars per instance times 10 to the third equities, turn to the fourth. Very quickly, the numbers get very, very large. But we can do this differently. The reason that we can do it differently is because the typical queries are by recipient, by stock symbol, or by sender. And so what we can do is we can go to a streaming first architecture. The transactions coming in can be exploded into multiple streams. The buy stock at the top has a topic by the equity symbol. The buy sender in the middle has a topic by the actual sender. The buy recipient at the bottom has a topic of the recipient. Now this does rearrange the data and it does a persistent rearrangement, but the rearrangement is very fast because the accesses are otherwise organized. Now the query service can look at whichever system it likes. If you want the most recent transactions for a particular recipient, it's merely a matter of reading from that topic. That's really, really fast. And the particular use case here, this is a demonstration sort of application, is able on three VMs to achieve four million transactions per second. 300,000 coming in from the left, an explosion by a factor of about 12, which adds up to roughly four million inserts into these queues with real-time queries supported at that same level. There is no database that would do fully general queries right now that can handle that kind of load. And so a streaming first architecture can often change the structural game and change the economic game very dramatically. Here's another example. Take an IoT for a customer. This is an application that's being fielded. They want to support data coming out, operational data, maintenance data coming out of cars at a rate of about two kilobytes per second, reported roughly every, every minute. 100 million cars is the number that they want to be supporting in a few years. Oh, and people roam, of course, with cars. They go from one service area to another. Again, we can use stream-first architecture. The ECU, the engine control unit in the car, can transmit via 3G or 4G networks using HTTPS into a gateway. And from there, we can use traditional streaming combined with tables and files so that we have a comprehensive current view of the engine state of every car and the operational state of these vehicles so that we can do complete maintenance histories, we can do current status, we can do emergency response, and all of the things that connected cars are supposed to do. The data rates here are prodigious. I, you know, the, the previous one was four million transactions on just a handful of machines, but here we're beginning to talk about terabytes to tens of terabytes per second. That the actual amount of data being transferred and collated and resolved is very, very high. And so these new technologies, which allow very high performance in conjunction with conventional things like we might want to know where each car's home data center is in a conventional table. That begins to be, again, showing huge benefits in terms of simplicity and economics. Now, we're going to have to change. I, I gave you an example of files a little bit ago where 40 years ago we would have a committee meeting with budget authority and after hours contact and contingency plans and things like that. And that seems insane from the current point of view. But if I say I want to do streaming, the conventional answer right now is, oh, we're going to have to have a committee meeting. Do you have budget authority for a Kafka cluster for your system? Because we can't do multi-tenancy very well. Or we want to do tables. Do you have budget authority for a specialized NoSQL database or a conventional database? Do you have an after hours contact number? All of these same committee meetings happen with these other systems. And that's mine. Uh, <laughs> I was about to uh, look at somebody and give them a hard time, but that's uh, probably not a good idea. So suppose we're going to build a fraud detector. It has a little database of 
uh, the, where the card was last used to profile. If we want to scale this, the traditional answer is to connect them to a shared database. This, as I've mentioned, leads to a lot of heat. Not necessarily technological heat, but heat in terms of multiple consumers having multiple agendas. Somebody wants an index, somebody can't abide an index. Somebody wants one schema, somebody else needs a different schema. That's why we have those committee meetings. That's why that gets hot. Databases don't do Agile very well. A better way to do that is to go to streaming for the shared data asset, where we can use non-relational full-scale data structures, which make it easier to add things later. This gives us the agility we need in the modern world and lets us build these transformational applications. Conventional storage won't do it because it's just data, doesn't have multiple forms. Traditional Hadoop doesn't do it because it doesn't handle traditional APIs. Spark alone won't do it. Spark in conjunction with a data platform can do it, but Spark alone won't do it. Cassandra or any of the NoSQL items won't do it because they, again, only handle one part of the need. They don't handle streaming or files. Other systems, all of them have these problems. We really need to look forward in technology to building full convergence of compute and data and all the different forms of data that we have. We need to converge rest and in motion. We need to converge on-premise and cloud. We need to converge legacy, next generation compute, batch, real time, and ultimately get a very glitzy slide. Uh, this has a lot of appeal to administrators. It simplifies the administration of the system. It unifies the assets that they're trying to control. This has appeal to developers because we don't have those committee meetings. We have flexibility. We can build systems quickly. And you could come talk to me. Booth is right out there. I'll be wearing a red jacket. We have probably like two minutes for questions. So I imagine we could do two questions if there's any questions left. Anybody got a question? Hello. Um, in your streaming, how do you manage the data integrity? Because I see you split up the initial data, which goes to different feeds. And then the query uh, analyzer needs to need some sort of relational link between the um, different feeds. So the, the questioner is asking, how do I manage data integrity? And in particular, makes a comment about referential integrity, I believe. And frankly, there are a number of things like clean fully modeled data, referential integrity, uh, the ability to alter the schema of the system that are incompatible with scaling. And I've given talks on this, but the fact that data value becomes marginally more at scale and data costs, if you do alter schema, if you do referential integrity, all become nonlinear upwards means you cannot scale and maintain that. I give you as an example, I'm going to pick on you. If you are the advocate of referential integrity, please, please, I've heard that the web lacks referential integrity. I can't use it until it's fixed. Could you please fix that? No, there's no way. That's because it's too large and it's out of our control. Likewise, Twitter doesn't guarantee referential integrity in their data stream. Could you fix that? No, because they won't listen to us. We are the consumers of their data, and more and more we consume data others produce and others control, and we cannot guarantee that they do it well. So what we need to do is not so much guarantee the integrity of all data sources, but build systems that deal with the world as it is. In the past, we could control our little tiny corner of the universe. We could make a beautiful garden. Now, it never happened, but we could have done it if we really wanted to. That is no longer even on the table. Now, data integrity at the platform level is a must. You must have absolute guarantees of consistency. The system must work correctly. It must deal with failures in hardware and things like that. But at a data and application level, you have to build systems that go beyond that primary need, primarily, in my mind, by inlighting critical dimensional data. There should be far fewer references than are true in a 
normal relational database. Time up, she says. I was wrong. <laughs> Only time for one question, but I'll have time for plenty more. Uh, we'll be having uh, all kinds of things, uh, notably some books to give away. Tomorrow, Ellen Friedman, my co-author, will be talking, and she'll be signing her book on Flink. Thanks very much. Thank you.